So uh, what's the motivation for this paper? You know, mortgage leverage choices are central for uh, macroeconomic activity, right? That, that we all know. So what's going to be our objective with this paper? We're going to try to explore the relationship between uh, individuals' beliefs, more in particular, it's going to be home buyers and borrowers' beliefs about house prices and how these beliefs influence their leverage choices. Okay, so the paper's going to be about the relationship between uh, borrowers, home buyers' beliefs, and how these affect their leverage choices. Okay, so what we're going to do in the paper, uh, you're going to see we're going to use a bunch of different methodologies to get this question. So, first, we're going to have some, uh, we're going to do some theoretical work. And we're going to build a parsimonious model uh, that's going to relate home buyers' belief to mortgage leverage choices. Let me give you the main result of our theoretical piece. Uh, we're going to find there's going to be an ambiguous relation between optimism and leverage. Okay, so we're going to show you, I'm going to show you in a second, that depending on um, the different conditions, you could have more optimistic home buyers uh, borrowing less, or you could have more optimistic home buyers borrowing more. You'll see in a second in which scenario, what are the conditions that you need to have one result or the other. Okay, that's going to be on the theoretical side. On the empirical side, um, using, uh, using Facebook data and specific identification, I'm going to discuss in a second, we're going to test for the cross-sectional relationship between home buyers' beliefs and leverage. So we're going to compare different home buyers. We're going to have a way to, to, uh, to, pro to come up with a belief shifter. Okay, and then we're going to study whether more optimistic or less optimistic investors, they borrow more or less. Okay, so the main empirical result, which again may be um, somewhat surprising, is we're going to find in the data, this is a purely empirical result, that more optimistic households, measuring the way I'm going to tell you in a second, uh, choose lower leverage. Okay, and this is going to be consistent with one of these scenarios that, uh, that our theoretical model uh, uh, predicts. Okay, so those are, those are the ideas. This is the main empirical finding, and then we're going to see that it's consistent with a particular way of, of uh, of individual behavior. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm in the first few minutes I'm going to just overview my results, just so you get a sense where we're going. Then I'm going to jump th to the theory. Then I'm going to describe to you the empirical methodology, and then I'll, I'll just conclude. Okay, so what is the theoretic? This the new theoretical insight that we're trying to bring. You know, in think about you know probably what you have in mind. You know, a lot of models of um, collateralized credit, okay, are going to have two different channels through which. Uh, Buyer's beliefs affect leverage choice. Okay, and that's what we're going to put in, in the theory. We're going to show that uh, there are two different ways in which the beliefs of borrowers affect their choice of leverage. Okay? One is what we're calling the paper this uh, perceived attractiveness of the investment. Okay? So let's say you're buying an asset and you're doing a collateralized purchase. Okay? You're buying a house, you need to decide how much you borrow into the house. Uh, if you're more optimistic about the performance of the house, this, this channel, this perceived attractiveness of the investment channel, is going to push you towards buying, uh, towards buying a bigger house. And if you have a finite set of resources, you're going to have to uh, take on more leverage to buy a bigger house. Okay, so the mechanism here is you're optimistic, you think the investment is better, you want to buy a bigger house because you have finite resources, you have to leverage more. Okay, so it's really coming from the fact that you want to have a larger property that you end up borrowing more. Oh, the second channel is what we call this um, perceived cost of borrowing. Okay? And this second channel it works in the following way. So um, there are two ways of putting it. Some people find one more intuitive. Some people find one. They want a bit more intuitive. So one way to think about it is the following. If you have the possibility uh, of defaulting, okay, and you're more optimistic, okay, you compare two individuals. One is more optimistic than the other. The one that is more optimistic thinks that it's going to repay uh, more often. Okay, so that person, in some sense, is finding credit more expensive. So that's going to push towards borrowing less. Okay, this is the kind of less intuitive way of putting the second mechanism. Another identical way of putting it, I think, it's related to what Rodney was mentioning, and I'm going to be more precise in a second too, is the f is the f is the following idea. Okay, think about whether you want to put more or less of your own money in the house. Think about where you want to put more or less of, of your own resources in a property. Okay? If, for example, you're extremely pessimistic, okay? let's say there's like some very bad outcome. You, know, you're gonna, there's, you think it's very likely that house prices are going to be low, and then you end up defaulting in your property. Okay? If you are very pessimistic about the performance of, of your house investment, you don't want to put a lot of your own money in the house. What you want to put is you want to buy the house, but then invest with borrowed money. Okay, so in that case, more optimism is going to push, sorry, more pessimism is going to push towards higher leverage, and more optimism is going to push 
towards less leverage. Okay, so both mechanisms go in opposite ways. What we're going to show, and that's thing that's close to Rodney's point, is the key parameter, the key primitive, the key feature of the model that determines whether this mechan which mechanism is going to be playing a bigger role is what we call in the paper the collateral adjustment friction, which we define as the willingness or ability to adjust property size. So the main theoretical results can be stated in the following way. If, um, what do I mean by this? Okay, think of a world in which you already have, you know, you know, and we're gonna, you know, motivate this in the context of housing by the consumption uh, features of a house. Okay, let's say you have already picked a property, you think it's the right property, you have a family size that you're uh, hoping to aim for. You're gonna buy like a two or three bedroom house in a given neighborhood. Okay, so you have already decided on, uh, on the size of your house. Okay, and then holding the house size fixed, uh, kind of the, fair, the first, uh, first channel is to mute because you are not adjusting on the, on the size of the house that you're buying. Kind of the amount that you're gonna spend is already fixed. So in that world, the only mechanism that's gonna be at play is gonna be this perceived cost of borrowing. Okay, so we're gonna say it's like if the collateral adjustment friction is infinity. If it's very hard for you to adjust your position in the underlying, being more optimistic is going to uh, be associated with lower leverage. Okay, so that's going to be one, one of the key predictions. If, on the other case, you're adjusting both on the size of the collateral and leverage, we're going to show that optimism, appropriately defined, is going to uh, be associated with higher leverage. Okay, so depending, kind of what we're saying is like, if it's very hard to adjust the position of your collateral, you should expect the second force to dominate. If you're in the other case, you should expect the first force. Both are going to be playing a role, but the first one's going to dominate once we define optimism in a appropriate way, which is what the theory is going to allow us to help. I had that one first. Sorry. Yes. So the price that you pay for your credit depends mm -hmm. on your leverage. Correct. In the mortgage market. Yeah. So that could be taken in. That's all going to be taken into account. So you will see how our stretch is going to be. We're essentially going to compare. That's an issue more about the empirics. So in the theory, you, always, you have schedule. You, you're picking, and then we're kind of taking a comparative study on like holding constant the lenders. You're going to look at, you're going to take a comparative study on whether take two borrowers and think one is more optimistic than the other, holding all that's constant, what happens? Those are the results that we have. Then when we go to the empirics, we're going to argue that that's the kind of exercise we're, we're doing. OK? It's not clear. It's, uh, no, I, no, it's I, a question about the theory, about the empirics. I'm imagining a mechanism that, that you're not. So what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is, so like if you have a LTV of greater than eight, you have to pay mortgage insurance, either FHA yes. or private mortgage insurance. That means it's much more expensive. Yeah, that's going to be there. Okay. That's going to be there. I mean, yeah, there's going to be a schedule. Yeah, and it's the same for everyone. That, that's going to be there. And your theoretical model has it. Right? Yeah, think about it. When you're shifting the beliefs, you are not shifting. The, the key, you see what's going to happen. It's about the lenders. If you're a lender, you really care mostly about whether you get paid and the value of the housing foreclosure. So we are only shifting the borrower's beliefs, not the lender's beliefs. All these comparative statistics only shift the borrower's beliefs. The lenders are going to help. We're not going to say anything interesting about lenders today. It's all about borrowers. Sorry, Andrew. Yeah. So is property size or property value the right metric? Like, I would have thought that it's property value. Are we talking, maybe I'm just interpreting size too literally? In uh, square footage, or do you mean? Like neighborhood expensive versus cheap neighborhood. Yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. So it's really gonna be like uh, it's more value. What we, what we really mean by size. So you need to include everything else, has amenities, neighborhood, every all the other features are gonna be there. And when you think about size, I really mean I should be saying value. Okay, in the model, it doesn't really matter, but in it's in practice, it's really value. So that's that's a fair point. Okay, so just to be which force we have in mind to restrict this exposure to the asset? Well. Again, owner-occupied housing has a number of features that make it special, family size, neighborhood. That's going to be our interpretation of the results. Okay? So on the empiricals, that was a theory. On the empirical side, we're going to do is, you know, we're going to test this cross-sectional relationship. We're going to combine this friendship network with uh, friends past house price experiences to build individual belief shifters. Okay? Essentially, what we're going to do is we have this snapshot observation of the Facebook network, and we're gonna, that's going to allow us to construct measures of the network of friends of the different individuals in our sample. We're going to, uh, you know, since we have all these, these individuals, we know uh, who are they related to. So we're going to combine this data with past uh, house price changes in the regions where the friends of a given individual, if a given individual uh, is living, okay? And using this, that's going to allow us to create these belief shifters, okay? So in the paper, 
Uh, you'll see how we do it. So we're going to establish a link between the beliefs of the, dif of the friends of a given individual and the actual beliefs of, of a given individual. And then this is going to be our belief shifter. We're going to use this as a measure <coughs> of optimism, pessimism. Okay. Uh, we're going to do parametric and non-parametric tests of the model. What's going to be the main result? Well, more optimistic households choose lower leverage. It's purely empirical. And you'll see we're going to have stronger results in the bus period, which is consistent kind of with the mechanism we're highlighting that works mostly in periods in which people really think about the possibility of defaulting. You'll see very clearly that if there's no default option, this second, uh, the second force that I have here is just not going to play a role. So we should expect the results to be much stronger in bus periods. That's going to be one of, one of the results. Okay, so for direct implications, again, we're kind of saying, and, and we're not saying anything interesting about credit supply. We're only saying that if we have borrowers that become more optimistic, it's it, what the data seems to suggest in, is that it's not going to be conducive uh, to, um, towards more leverage. Okay, so in fact, what we show is that it pushes towards less leverage. This, again, to think about aggregate implications, if lenders were to be more optimistic, that would be completely different. Okay, because that would be, uh, then borrowers will face like cheaper credit and they will borrow more. So it's kind of pushing towards theories that uh, explain arid leverage coming from shifts in credit supply, not credit demand. All right. All right. So let me let me kind of give you the main theoretical results in the first in the first part of the talk. So the environments it's uh, quite stylized. So there are going to be two dates, zero and one. There's going to be housing good and the consumption good. Price are going to be P zero and P one. So it's partially clear. We're not close. We're not going to be closing. The model. Okay, so they're going to be borrowers. I, uh, that's this is going to be a bunch of them. We're going to do comparative statics on, on their beliefs, and then lenders who are on the other side. They're providing this credit supply function. Okay, so these are our preferences. Okay, so we're going to have borrowers have like curve utility in the initial period. In the final period, we're going to assume that they are, um, they have linear preference. Okay, so this is killing a lot of uh, staff with like you know risk aversion and so on. This is really to highlight. Uh, the, the key mechanisms, and this is going to allow us to kind of provide analytical, analytical uh, results. Okay, so they maximize utility of initial consumption plus expected value of their of their future wealth. So borrowers are going to choose consumption. Um, house size again, you should this age you should think you know there are other things that kind of go in there necessarily like the physical amount of, of the the size, but uh, other characteristics should be included there, and leverage. It's gonna, we're going to use this measure, which is the amount uh, that we promise in the future relative to the initial value of the house. Okay? As we just do this because the questions look a bit nicer. But we're gonna, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between this and the standard measure, which is like amount borrowed over value of the house. Okay? So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between those two variables. All right? So investors are going to have a collateralized non-recourse loan. This is important. Okay? So our foc this is an environment with collateralized credit. And um, non-recourse is going to make the results uh, very sharp. So if in case of, um, in case of default, the lenders uh, are not going to be able to go after any of the assets of, of the borrower. Okay? So in the paper, actually it's in the appendix of the current version of the paper, we have uh, a default loss for the talk. I'm just going to set it to zero. So essentially, you have this ruthless default. It's not crucial at all. You can have a positive, a positive cost of default. You can think of pecuniary or non-pecuniary. But it just makes everything simpler if you, if you don't have it. We're kind of rewriting um, the paper, and we're actually doing everything with the default cost embedded. So this is really a simple simplification, OK? Just to make things easier. This is the key assumption, OK? So we're going to assume that uh, G, which is the, um, the growth in house prices, OK? This, this, is, uh, this is something that is exogenous in, in this model, and it's something uh, it's a variable over which different borrowers have different beliefs. Okay, so there's going to be a distribution, F of I, indexed by I. So each borrower is going to have a different distribution about what do they think are the possible scenarios over house price, price growth uh, or in, in the future. So it's going to be FI, one per each investor, and then the lenders going to have FL. I'm going to tell you in a second, and it could be different from this one. It could be something, some, anything different, that, which is going to the previous questions about Lenders are also going to be mute. But yeah, the short answer is there's a different one for lenders. Uh, so they are going to be doing, oh, so this is, this, is really, this is really it. There's only one thing I need to tell you, which is I'm going to add in a second uh, these special housing preferences to capture the fact that so far what I've told you, this could be a stock market investment. There's nothing in which housing is special here. Okay? 
I'm going to tell you in a second how I model this specialness of, of housing. Uh, on the lending side, there's going to be an LTV ratio. It's going to depend on the promise. Okay, so think about this as uh, the dollars of you get today over the value of the house is a function of your promise. Okay, so it's going to be scale. It's going to be set by these competitive risk neutral lenders. Okay, this is the this, this is case, and then in equilibrium, uh, these borrowers are going to pick consumption, uh, borrowing, housing, and default to maximize the utility subject to this LTV ratio. I again, without making any, any assumptions on the housing preferences. So this is the problem. Okay, once I, I look at the default option of the, of the borrowers, I just, this is going to be their future expected value of their wealth, and this is going to be their, their budget constraints. So they have some initial resources they can either consume or they could buy a house. This is the house size, is the value, and one minus lambda is the amount they have to put out of pocket. Okay, so lambda is the L LTV ratio. Okay, so this is their constraint, and the future is you know the utility of consumption today, plus essentially is the value of their housing investment, and this is the return on the housing investment, which is over the uh, region in which they repay. They're going to get the house price appreciation minus this normalized repayment. Okay, so this is the problem that um, that these uh, home buyers are going to solve. How do we model? How do we model the um, collateral adjustment friction in the paper? Okay, so what we're going to assume is uh, we have this uh, this formulation in which, like, we, we are kind of saying like there is a region over which people are happy buying a house in some sense. So you're going to have to pick H H zero. Your house choice is going to be within a given region. Okay. And sometimes, and you know, and outside of that, you really don't don't want to buy a, a house that is outside this region. Okay, so what are we trying to model here? We could do something a bit smoother, which is the way most people do. You have like a preference for for utility of housing that is separate from the pecuniary benefits. The reason to do it this way is that we're going to compare cases in which you are the constraint versus not, which I guess it goes back to Rodney's original point, and is kind of the intuition I'm trying to give you. Sometimes we'll consider the fact that your H0 choice is fixed, and sometimes we allow the choice to vary. And then we're going to understand how changes in beliefs determine your leverage choice in those scenarios. Okay, So uh, the hard constraint formulation is really only to be able to derive kind of clear analytical results. More broadly, you could have something that is a bit smoother, and you, know, you can solve it numerically, and you'll get pretty similar intuitions. Okay, So the key, the key assumption is whether it is easy uh, to adjust the the uh, <coughs> the size of your housing investment or not? Okay, and that's the way we're going to model it. So our setup generalizes Simsex uh, 2013 paper. Okay. It's special. That is special case of of this one. These are the first three conditions. Okay, so this is your optimality condition for housing. This is your optimality condition for leverage. Uh, if you buy a, if you buy a bigger house, well, the cost is you have to pay a price, and again, you need to put up the um, the amount. Uh, you don't only need to put up this amount ex ante, so it's the marginal cost today. What is the marginal benefit? In the states in which you keep the house, you're going to get uh, this extra uh, house price appreciation. And then if, when you lever, OK, what is the marginal benefit of uh, kind of increasing your promise tomorrow? Well, today you're going to get more funds, OK? You're going to get, uh, which you're going to value the marginal value of wealth today. Tomorrow, what is the marginal cost of promising extra unit in the state in which I repay? have to pay for that unit, so this is the marginal cost. Would I, wh why are those things highlighted there? Because those are the only two places in which the beliefs of borrowers show up. Okay, so everything that I'm, that's going to, everything else, it's not showing up. All the questions I've got about lenders, all the lambdas, yeah, the lenders are going to be an important part of the problem, but really if you want to understand uh, how borrowers' beliefs matter for leverage, you need to understand how this term and that term behave. You can, if you are able to hold everything else constant, that's all you need to focus on. And these terms are the two terms I was trying to describe at the beginning with words. This is the term that we call this uh, expected return of investment. It's this notion that you want to buy bigger houses, okay? And this is the term that I was, the second term, which is coming from the fact that uh, changes on beliefs also affect the probability of repayment of your loan. That's what's really working here. So now, how they play together is not determining whether we go one way or another, okay? Channel one, expect a return of investment. Channel two is marginal cost of borrowing or saving. So now, uh, this is I have You know, this is what you get. Oh, so this is the Lagrange multiplier on the constraint. So if this this is not binding, then I have these two equations. If this is um, binding, then essentially you kind of drop the first one. That's just giving me the value of the Lagrange multiplier. 
So what do we get now? Now let's go to the two scenarios we like to consider. Scenario one is what we call housing as investment. Okay, and we call it the way because then we think that you know this housing target constraints slack. The house size is determined purely from the investment aspect of housing. This is the setup that is like Genicopolis or Simsec. That's the one that they're thinking about. Uh, what is nice is that you can kind of you can combine. There's some nice um, homogeneity properties in the way we set up the problem. You can combine both equations and you only have one that is going to pin down leverage. So in that case, all you care about is this object here. So essentially, uh, you can see that the ratio of this to this becomes this truncated expectation. So all we need to, you know, all that pins down the optimal leverage for a given individual when you don't have the housing constraint binding is this object over here. This doesn't depend on beliefs. Only so if you can characterize the value of that object, then you have everything. So something else I want to emphasize is that beliefs, especially in this setup, are multi-dimensional, are a high-dimensional object. It's an infinite dimensional object. I have the whole distribution. I haven't made assumptions on that yet. Okay, so that's why I've always made this emphasis on like the appropriate definition of optimism. It was going to allow us to make an ambiguous prediction about, lever about leverage. Okay, so in this world, uh, all we need to, you know, if we want to determine that the indi individual J has higher, lever than, higher leverage than individual I, it has to be that the individual J has a higher truncated expectation uh, for each value of delta. Okay, so if this truncated expectation is higher for every value of delta, remember this isn't a function of the truncation point, then you can conclude that one is going to have higher leverage than the other. Okay, and in that case, under this definition of optimism, essentially what we are showing is that the expected return force dominates the marginal cause of borrowing force. Okay, uh, I mentioned the relationship with all the other literature in leverage cycles, which kind of emphasizes this type of this type of result. What happens when the housing target constraint is binding? Well, then kind of we drop the middle equation that I show you, and leverage is being done by the second one. Okay, you get marginal benefit and marginal cost. Here, you only care about the probability of default in our simple in our kind of in our simple environment. So essentially, you can look at for sort of stochastic dominance. So if you are one individual is more optimistic than the other according to this to this measure, then uh, it's going to go kind of in the opposite way. More optimistic people are, are going to be borrowing um, less. Okay, and it's the mechanism I told you before. If let's say you are very optimistic, okay, about the value of your house. You cannot buy a bigger house. You already kind of have pinned down the size of your house. What you want to do is put a lot of your own money in, in the investment. You want to max out as much equity as you can. That is the mechanism that's, that's behind here. If you're pessimistic, you want to do exactly the opposite. You want to take the biggest loan that you can because you think it's very likely that you don't, that you don't pay for it. Okay, so those are, this is the force that is dominating here. So the model is essentially telling us what are the right measures of optimism and pessimism uh, in the two different scenarios. Okay? So, uh, you know, in the first one, you need to look at this truncated expectation. In the second scenario, this housing as consumption, you only focus on for stochastic dominance. There are two ways of going here. One way is to go non-parametric, and we'll do a little bit of this in the paper, which is like we can show there's another result that has a right stochastic dominance, the right measure of optimism here. Uh, this is just in a stochastic order. It's just a way to tell one distribution is more optimistic than the other. So this one has some nice features because we can test these results without making any distributional assumptions, which is nice. This, the downside is that you don't have a complete ordering. So we're not going to put a lot of um, effort in this route. We're going to kind of do something different, which is we're going to assume that the distribution of G is normal. And that's going to make things a bit more kind of intuitive. So we're going to have a mean and a variance. And then uh, that's going to, you know, the downside of this is we're going to we're gonna need to make a distributional assumption. The upside is you can rank every individual, and then that's going to give us a bunch of additional predictions about boom bust, about, um, you know, variance is not something that is optimism, pessimism, it's more about the dispersion of beliefs. So that's, that's what we're doing in the paper. Um, just very briefly, I only have 15 minutes, so let me just kind of give you kind of how this works, for example, and how you get the different predictions. This is a normal distribution, okay, and then we are comparing, what we're going to be doing in the paper is like comparing to borrowers, one that has a higher mean than the other, for example. Okay, that's what we're going to be doing now in empirical specification. So if um, you compare these two individuals, okay, and this is the default threshold, you, we're going to hold it fixed. Okay, you see that if you increase the mean, this truncated expectation, that is the mass of the distribution, that is to the right, is, also, is going to be increasing. So that suggests that the guy, this guy with a um, dash distribution, has a higher mean 
a higher tranquility expectation, so it's going to have a higher LTB. In the case of uh, hazardous consumption scenario, if the guy with a higher mean uh, perceives a, um, a, lower a higher probability of repayment, a lower probability of default, and we say that that's what's going to be associated with a, with a low LTV through a mechanism that I just described. Okay, so this is the way you do it. You could do the same for variance. I don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I won't do it. There are more predictions in the paper. I won't bore you with all of them. I just kind of wanted to give you a sense of how we're getting the results. So uh, we can show a bunch of things. So the most important ones, like in, in bus periods, in periods in which house prices are on average lower, okay, you're going to expect um, you're going to expect uh, the effects of the housing as consumption to be, uh, to the effect of changes in mu to be, to be uh, dampening the boom and amplifying in the bus. So in, in, in when house prices are lower, you expect the effects on the housing as consumption scenario to be larger in magnitude, like more negative. If you're in a boom, you expect the effects to be dampened. Okay? So that's just another prediction that we get, that we get from the theory. Uh, so in pre analysis, let me, let me get to here. Okay, so what is the ideal test here? You want to compare two individuals, identical uh, individuals, which are in the, buying the same house in the same place, but with, but with different beliefs. That would be the ideal experiment maps to the data. Okay? What is the challenge? And that's why, you know, even though the, the theoretical literature is very prominent, you know, the general couples and so on, like it's been very hard to kind of make practical. So it's really hard to measure beliefs, and it's also really hard to measure beliefs in a way that is orthogonal to, to other things. So uh, we're going to use this belief shifters approach, which is similar to what Hans and Therese had in, in, a, in a previous paper. Uh, we're going to look at um, house prices experiences of geographically distant friends and see how those affect that. And, you know, and we're going to use them as a, as a shifter of individual beliefs. Okay? So we're going to argue these are orthogonal to home buyer characteristics and other factors influencing the leverage decision. So there are two steps in this logic. First is uh, establish a link between the experiences of friends of a given individual and the beliefs of that individual. The second step is in, we're going to be that's the main regression approach. We're going to look at friends' experiences and how they affect leverage. Uh, we're going to be using it's not the static thing; it's the interaction of the network with the change in prices over time. So that's going to address. If you think through that, that's going to address almost all the concerns that people will have. Because we're not just exploiting the network, it's just the, it's the interaction of the network with the variation in house prices across different zip codes over time. So that's the variation that we're exploiting, not the static variation of whether I have more friends in a place or another. So I just want to make sure I understand this. When you say collateral adjustment conversion, what I read that as until I, I looked again is, mm -hmm. is, is an adjustment over time. But that's not really what you mean. Now. What you're really saying is that the relative demand for housing coming from investment and consumption. Correct. That's what you're that's saying. What Yes, sorry for so clear. Yes. So one quick point, and I'm wondering if you're going to address it on your next slide. But it's, um, so if I understand you correctly, you're going to make, uh, you're not going to address it in that, in that slide, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, you, um, so to what extent, I see that, that figure 400 friendship links, and to, and to what extent I, I wonder, like, why would I care? You know, it's great that you have 400 friends on Facebook, but if you're really making that decision on leverage choices and using your social network to come up with a leverage decision and say, okay, this seems to be the social norm, uh, whether to, to come up with a baseline of whether you're over leveraging or under leveraging. And to be honest, I really couldn't care less about what my friend in Australia that I shared a beer with. Okay, let me, I'm going to just two slides. So very briefly, uh, we have the snapshot of the network, which allows us to construct the network. And then we're going to combine this with uh, housing transaction data. This is Axiom data. It's, there's a match between uh, uh, the identity you have in Facebook and this, this uh, transaction data. In this version, we're doing only LA, very appropriate. Uh, in the new version, we're actually extending to more, to more zip codes across the US to test like recourse, non recourse, to make a bunch of, bunch of new tests. Okay? But what I'm showing you today, we're only, I'm going to show you the results for, for, the, uh, for LA. Okay? We have the details of the property, transaction price, and mortgage information. So think about it. We cannot talk about rent or buying margin. We're only talking about uh, home purchases. Okay, so it's not about changing over time. It's really whether you buy is kind of whether you are going to adjust along the dimension of buying a bigger or smaller house. That's that's really what we got. So how do we construct these belief shifters? So the network is endogenous, and that was my answer to Rodney before too, and to kind of I think it 
you may have a lot of points, but like, oh, people, you know, they select the image. What it's, uh, what we're kind of trying to argue is that there's sufficient variation in these networks that the interaction of the network with the house price changes uh, over the past 24 months, which is the measure that we use to construct this belief distribution, is it's what it's exogenous. So you have this individual here. Again, this person has a lot of friends in LA, but this guy has a lot of friends in North Carolina, some people in Florida, some people here in the West Coast. Okay, and how this price changes are in the different zip codes across the country, that's what's going to give us the variation that we are using, not the fact that this person has friends in different places. So you can compare this guy to this other guy who has friends, I think this is Minnesota. Uh, again, more people, this is Seattle area. So this is kind of that's the second point, that's a fair point. So we're going to get a substantial variation on house price changes across zip codes. So this is the distribution that you have when you plot them across different zip codes. We picked 2013, 2015. So there is variation. So there's definitely they make, you know, they make commos and that, but they, they, it's not that they always, they always move, they're always the same. So we, you do definitely have uh, changes in house price across different zip codes over time, and that's what we're, we're going to be exploiting here. So in the paper, you know, have a bunch more figures trying to argue, first, that, you know, like, different people have different set of friends, and second, that there's sufficient variation in house price changes over uh, the last 24, uh, or two-year periods to be able to use this variation as possibly exogenous, okay? So I had a question before, how do we establish? You may not care about, you know, whether I talk to my Facebook friends or not. We're gonna try to establish in the first step is whether people, you know, actually, you know, the beliefs of their friends affect their beliefs. So in this survey, this is run by Facebook, April 2017, it's small surveys, okay? So we're not, this is very costly to run for a number of reasons. So again, you log in and then you get this thing. You wanna participate in the survey for researchers and then we ask people, how often do you talk to friends about whether Biden has a good investment? And something that there was in the previous paper, like the paper, other paper was, they do something similar, but it's, it's all qualitative. Here we're being more quantitative. So we're asking people to give us the full distribution because that's really the key object of interest. So we kind of force people to tell us whether they, want, they think house prices over the next 12 months in, their, in the average home, if the average home, their zip code is gonna increase by 12%, eight to 12, four to eight. So this thing has to up to 100, okay? This is the result of the regression. We don't have a lot of power given the number of observations, but what, what, you, what you show is that mean, and we know who this individual is, and then we, can, we know the network of individuals, so we can also calculate the house price experiences of the friends of these individuals that answer the survey and run that, uh, the mean of that distribution on the mean that they report, okay? So what we find is that uh, people whose friends over the last 24 months had higher high price growth on average, they report, uh, they report a higher average belief in the market in their, in their own local uh, zip code, and you get a similar effect when you look at the variance. So more dispersion across friends also tells them that they report more. So again, that's gonna be our, the part of the paper that tries to link uh, the beliefs of friends, the experience of, uh, that friends have to the beliefs of a given individual. Again, this is the costliest thing to do because like, you gotta like you know mess up with people and um, no. So we didn't ask this. This all we ask: um, how often you talk to, and then the uh, what they, they perceive. It would be great to ask other things, but we that's like one of the main limitations we have. This is gonna be the main specification. So we're gonna be testing. We do the non-parametric tests in the paper. That's like pretty. It's not very interesting because I just compare two numbers. I like you sort people and then you see whether they they satisfy the non-parametric restriction. The parametric test you run LTV. Okay, and remember this is the transaction, uh, the transaction um, that's the unit of observation and a transaction at a given period of time. And we're gonna have this mean and this standard deviation of this distribution of beliefs constructed in the way I told you by looking at the um, house price growth experience of, of uh, difference of a given individual over the last 24 months. And this is very important. Again, I, I mentioned this at the beginning. We're using uh, year time, uh, where your time zip code fix effect, okay? And we also do there some month fix zip code fix effect. So we are really looking at, you know, you wanna think of people going at the same period, the same zip code. So that's what's allowing us to control for the lending conditions, okay? So we're kind of, they are gonna, they should be facing pretty similar uh, credit uh, supply conditions, okay? And then we're gonna, you know, the main, these parameters, these betas are gonna be the key uh, objects of interest, okay? Um, what are the main results? Uh, so you see here that uh, this is kind of the main coefficient, if you want. 
is uh, telling us that the mean, if you have a higher mean, if in the distribution of the beliefs of your friend over the last 24 months, you're going to be borrowing. Uh, you're going to be borrowing less. Okay, so this is the negative sign here. Uh, then we also have uh, we also have the tests for um, the standard deviation. So I didn't mention this much, but also like if you have a higher standard deviation, you should be borrowing more. That's also coming from the theory. It's another thing we we test. So these two work, and then these are like for different periods. Uh, all right. So you see how in what we call this a uh, bus period, which is 99 to 06, you find at uh, so this is the boom period, I'm so sorry, and this is the bus period. So in the bus period, you see a much stronger effect in absolute value than in the boom period, which is also consistent with a the theoretical result. So you should expect this effect to be much stronger in periods where you think that house prices are going to be going down in, in the future. That's, that's kind of what we get here. Uh, about the magnitudes, and I'm in the last minute, uh, instead of giving you this number, I'm going to give you the one that combines this regression with the one with the survey. Okay? So essentially, by combining this estimate with the previous one, I can tell you uh, what I think is more meaningful, not what your friends think, but just the mapping between uh, what your expectation of house price growth uh, is and how that changes your LTV ratio. So the idea is like if you have a one percentage point expected house price growth okay, over the next 12 months, this means that, you're gonna, that your LTV ratio is going to be 35 basis, basis points lower, okay, which is... I mean, it's, again, it's an LTV, okay? So, so you have like point, uh, so you have like point, uh, you have a point 85 LTV ratio, so this will move it to like a point uh, 815. Okay, so these are like kind of the kind of magnitudes that you're getting, which is reasonable, I think, but it's, it's not like also, there are other determinants of leverage too, but this is kind of the sense of the magnitudes. Okay, and I'm, this is house price growth with LTV ratio, which is combining that coefficient with the one from, from the previous regression to transform uh, beliefs from your friends to your, to your own beliefs. I'm out of time. Okay, so there are a bunch of robustness checks and probably this may come up on the questions. We also do a bunch of stuff kind of trying to show this mechanism applies in practice. We have this Barron's advice, so I'll just leave it here so you can read it about how people talk exactly about this mechanism of uh, not putting a lot of equity if you think you're going you're gonna to lose your house. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for inviting me to discuss. This is a super interesting paper. I Learned quite a bit uh, just reading it myself and uh, kind of looking into the, the related literature. Um, so very briefly, what uh, the core of the paper here, basically as I see it, combines this interesting theoretical observation uh, with really just next generation data. I mean, something that um, you know we haven't really had access to before that I think is really going to change a lot of things in, th in this kind of real estate sphere. But also, I think it has the possibility to do so outside of this area as well. So the main results theoretically, so they show that this relationship uh, between leverage and price expectations about housing uh, in the future is ambiguous. And then, you know, this motivates the empirical test uh, or the empirical analysis, which is to say, um, you know, that, then to, uh, to use this Facebook data uh, where they show that the relationship is indeed negative. Um, so from a methodological point of view, I think it's also quite nice because Measuring beliefs in the field is quite difficult. So I do most of my work in the lab, but it's quite easy, easy to just ask people or incentivize people to tell you what they uh, believe. But, but doing this in the field is very hard. Uh, and so I think this paper, uh, it uses clearly a novel source of belief formation. But at the same time, it also validates it with a survey. So that, that's actually quite nice. Uh, and I think a good uh, methodological contribution. Uh, so my comments, I basically have three. I'm going to focus on the first one, um, which is I think it's possible that some of these results could be through shifting beliefs, but through a different channel. So I'm going to focus most of my comments on that. And then uh, at the end, just say a few quick words about um, you know, whether this belief shock impacting leverage is symmetric or not. So is it actually also coming, uh, is, it, is it exclusively coming on the downside, or do, are we actually seeing this on both sides? And then, and then I'll say a few words just on the interpretation uh, of this collateral adjustment friction. Uh, okay, so right now, the way I see it in the paper is the focus is exclusively on uh, beliefs about future house prices. So I would maybe push the authors a little bit to think more broadly about what else people can learn uh, about from their, house, or from their friends' housing experiences. Okay? So for example, in the last period of the model, uh, which Eduardo, he kind of extracted from in the talk, uh, but it's in the paper. 
uh, the borrower's decision to default is going to depend on the perceived cost of default, this phi parameter. And uh, so the ex-ante probability of the default is going to be increasing in the leverage they take on in the first period. And so, of course, then this, this cost will in part determine the, the leverage choice in the last period. So I think, you know, it could be interesting to think about, well, what actually determines this cost uh, in practice? And so there's this uh, nice taxonomy that uh, Gizo, Sapienza, and Zingales talk about in this JF paper from 2013, where they discuss both financial and non-financial components of this cost. So for instance, you know, when you default, it could be costly to relocate. It also is going to obviously hit your uh, credit score in a negative way. You also lose out a little bit on the option value of waiting to choose to sell you know, if house prices were to go up. And then, of course, there's also non-financial costs. So four uh, would be kind of a more behavioral motive, things like uh, you know, thinking about the morality of leaving uh, a house or, and also the social stigma associated with this. So in that same paper by Giso et al., they, they run a bunch of surveys. And this is just one chart I thought was interesting and kind of illuminating. They just ask a fra you know, homeowners, what do you think, uh, or, or is it amoral? Is it, uh, is it morally wrong to walk away from a house that's underwater? And the dynamics here are less interesting. It's just that the average level is quite high. So it means that four to five people that were asked about this say, yeah, it's not moral to walk away. Um, and I think homeowners can maybe learn about this component of this cost over time, uh, particularly from friends in those counties that are experiencing the most defaults. Okay? So, for example, here's just the four cities that were at the center of the housing bust. So we have Miami, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Las Vegas. So the same qualitative picture. So you have you know, the run-up and then the crash uh, around 2009. And it seems that homeowner interest in learning about the strategic default cost increased during the crisis, and particularly in those states that were hit hardest by the housing crisis. So this, uh, this is a figure that uh, I updated from uh, this paper by Buta et al. in the JF. It's just a Google search trend chart. And so you just type in the word strategic default. So you can't really see the, the x-axis here. But this is 2005. This is 2014. And so you see the run-up kind of right in the crisis. So people are, are looking. They're getting much more interested in kind of figuring out what this is. And interestingly, you could also see where, you know, cross-sectionally, you know, in, in the country, where most of the interest is coming from. And it's coming from those same types of regions, right? So California, Florida, uh, and Arizona. Okay, so why is this interesting? So how can this help us think about other channels? Well, I think it's plausible that the LA County residents that are in the sample here can also learn from friends about, you know, the strategic uh, default um, uh, idea. So this could potentially reduce the perceived costs of these homeowners, maybe thinking about you know, undergoing the strategic default, perhaps because they realize now that there's less stigma associated with doing this, or you know, maybe a more rational channel, they understand that the credit score reduction may not be as large as they initially thought. And so this suggests you know, this potential alternative mechanism. Let me just walk through very quickly here. So if, so, you, know, if you observe your friend's house prices going down, on average, you should see more strategic defaults. This could then lower the perceived cost of the default, right? Which would then, in your subsequent housing choice, maybe lead you to take on increased leverage. Okay, so the summary of the, of the mechanism here is that lower house price changes among your friends leads to higher uh, leverage, which is, what's, which is what the authors find. Uh, and I think it's also interesting to note that this mechanism is potentially asymmetric, right? Which is, if you flip the sign of the first link in the mechanism here, and you first say, you know, let's see if you have a friend whose house price increases, well then, yeah, you should see lower strategic defaults, but I would argue that the, the kind of link between two and three here is not as strong in this case, right? Because defaults are basically more salient than non-defaults. So you, you don't really learn a ton about the perceived cost of borrowing when you see everything's good, right? So this would be kind of like the repo man that didn't bark, right? So you only learn about uh, you know, repossessions and the cost of these defaults when, when things are actually uh, um, kind of going negative. And so, so let's look at the author's main results then. So um, this is table three. So, so this is the first column. This is the, the table that um, Eduardo showed. 
So the regression here is, is LTV on the left, and then the key independent variable is the friend's house price experience uh, on the right, and it's this, this variable right here. And so here's a negative coefficient. So this is, you know, this could be explained potentially by this uh, alternative mechanism, but that alternative mechanism could potentially also explain the asymmetry as well, right? So here's the subsample analysis. This is the uh, boom period. This is the bust period. And so recall, Eduardo showed us that uh, in the bust period, the results are super strong, but not so much in the boom period. So this could be the case that, you know, in, when everything's going well, in the, in the boom period, we don't see a lot of these defaults, and so there's not a lot of action on the change in the perception of this fee, in the perception of this uh, strategic default cost. And so, of course, this is just speculative right now, but I think, you know, it's plausible and perhaps straightforward, and I obviously don't work with this type of data too much, but it would be interesting maybe to construct uh, a new variable which is analogous to the author's main variable, but instead of using uh, friend's house price experience, you just replace it with the observed number of strategic defaults in the friend's county, right? So this, this variable, this uh, component before was the delta P, the, the change in house prices for the friends in county C, so just change it to the number of strategic defaults. My guess is it's going to be highly correlated with the uh, house price change, but you could then just add both and see which one is kind of driving more of the variation. Um, OK, so two last things in the last two minutes I guess I have. Um, so the authors derive predictions about the effect of a belief shock as a function of the homeowner's priors, of you know the exogenous kind of uh, belief that they have before they see these house price changes. So this, this nicely motivates the boom versus bust analysis. Um, the sign of the belief shock, I think, may also affect the relationship between leverage and beliefs. So it could be for exogenous reasons. So Cami Kudin, for instance, has a paper showing that people just update differently based on good versus bad news. Or it could, it could occur endogenously, perhaps through this learning about default, default cost channel I was just talking about. Because in this situation, you would, affect, you would expect most of the action to be on the negative belief shock, right? Because you're not really changing your beliefs when you see positive news. Uh, and so this, I think, would also, I think, be straightforward to test. Uh, you could just split that variable into kind of positive and negative counterparts. So, you know, this is equal to the mean friend house price. If positive, zero otherwise. And then the same thing, uh, or, or the, the converse on the downside. And then you could test beta 1 and beta 2 separately. So you could test you know, uh, both whether more optimism is actually lowering leverage. And then on the opposite side, is less optimism actually giving you higher leverage? Um, OK, last point I'll make. Um, so the, the key parameter that's driving this theoretical result about the ambiguity between uh, uh, beliefs and leverage is this collateral adjustment friction. So, I mean, ideally, it would be nice to get a direct measure of this, but I, that's, that's clearly hard. But maybe you could get something like, is the housing actually owner-occupied, right? Because this would increase the size of the friction. At the same time, I'm just wondering, might this friction not be terribly strong in practice, at least on the upside? Uh, what I mean by that is, if you have a positive belief shock, it seems relatively easy to upgrade the existing home but of course, you can't do that on the downside, right? If you get a, a negative belief shock, you're not going to go out and sell your pool, uh, presumably. So this could generate an asymmetric friction and then actually push you more towards that housing as investment scenario. So I would just wonder, um, you know, if this is actually asymmetric in practice, how might this affect uh, some of the model predictions? Um, OK, so in summary, very interesting paper. I mean, the data is just amazing. Uh, I, I didn't really talk any, about any of the concerns about you know, endogeneity. And the reason I didn't do that is because there's another paper using the same data set that was recently published. And I'm just taking as given that <laughs> that kind of went through all of the uh, 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 potential comments and concerns, and they've kind of uh, answered those. So my main comment is really just about maybe reinterpreting the main result or the main channel. And even if it happens to be this way, I think it's still quite interesting because it's just another spin on beliefs affecting leverage. Um, so very interesting. So thanks for having me discuss, Rodney. Thank you, Gary. I, I just, 
Uh, on, the, on the endogeneity of the matches, uh, I, I, I take your point that it's, you're taking, looking at the differences. Um, but here you sort of have a local average people effect where you're estimating your effect based on a, on a particular set of demographics, which are probably the people who have um, either a lot of variation in house prices among their friends, or the people who actually have few friends. Because when they have few friends, there's a lot more variance in the house prices. So I'm actually wondering whether you're not estimating it based on people who have very few friends. Uh, and, and whether you can reweigh your sample to get a more average treatment effect than a low blood. <laughs> Brian? The uh, suggestion, so Kerry, I think, made a good point that you ought to think about beliefs about other aspects of housing changing. Um, but probably the other thing, I mean, I thought you could even take that more broadly. Because um, if you think about what's really salient among your friends' network, it's probably the people that are unemployed. And, 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 the, and what's going on in the regional economy in terms of employment risk. Um, and I think if we go back to the mortgage default literature, what we've learned is that you know, strategic default's there, but it's not, it's not huge. Uh, and, and much more driven by income shocks and job loss and so forth. And so um, really, I mean, I, I would suggest maybe you take the paper even more broadly and think about um, employment risk and what you learn from kind of these regional variations in, in, in risk of job loss, and then how that feeds back into various decisions. I mean, I think the housing and mortgage choice is one, but if you can observe other stuff, I mean, that's probably even more interesting. So I, I'd sort of push you to think about that, um, both as potential con con confounding variation here. I mean, as I think of it, though, you know, it, I would think that home prices are moving inversely with unemployment rates, and, and actually you kind of get the opposite, a prediction of the opposite effect of what you find. Um, as, as I was thinking through it, and, you know, if, you're, if the beliefs that are really affected are about job loss. Um, but anyway, I'd, I'd encourage you to think more about that, because what you're measuring is house price beliefs might really be a whole set of beliefs about the local economy, um, informed by your friend's, friend's uh, experience. Yeah, just, uh, just to make sure I understand this correctly, so you Uh, we're actually, I mean, I didn't spend, I mean, we're an out of community zone, out of commuting zone beliefs as an instrument, and I didn't spend a lot of time on this. So to avoid a lot of the local, I, I don't know if you're going there, but what we're, we're using out of commuting zone um, experience of your friends as an instrument for your beliefs, for like what but you but think of your friends. The assumption here, though, okay, so take two adjacent zip codes, my zip code, I, I, I don't take into account that my friends are the same zip code as me, the assumption that they're not Take. I, I think that it's the same. I, I don't only use. Yes, no, so there's no, like, there's no, so each of your friends gets the same weight in some sense. So if you. Even if they live even if they live in um, Minnesota, and, if, and you live here. So that's, that's, that's what we have. I mean, they may, this may not be perfect. Okay, so, so not all the users are also in LA? The... No, of course not. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Sorry, this wasn't clear at all. Like, we are focused on people living in LA County, but they have friends everywhere in the US. So we're using the variation across the different zip codes. So do you have any information on how, how long people have been in the area, especially in LA? You have so many external people that moved in from uh, either abroad or from different states or from different. So uh, what I'm trying to hit at is how is your, how long have you experienced with local LA real estate markets, or did you already form any beliefs in the LA real estate market by yourself, or are you completely informed by your? external, so to say, experiences in either other countries, or other states, other cities. So that's, um, is that something I would maybe look into as well if possible? No, so I mean, we have this snapshot of the network. We don't know how long people have been living there. So the sure answer is no. I think that, that will also be interesting in how the beliefs are formed. To Andrew's point, just to be clear, we're focused on people in LA, but they have friends everywhere. So it's the variation across the United States what we're using, and we are not weighting the beliefs of people in different places differently. So we are, I mean, everyone gets the same. The sur the, what the sur in the survey, we also don't do it. So the fact that the survey shows a positive link, it's, again, 
uh, it, it suggests that the mechanism is there. Carries points, I mean, super. Let me also say, like, we've been in between a huge revision for the paper. I was hoping to say we address every point the carries in. I, I think we partially did. So in the new, let me tell you a bit what the new version has. So the new version doesn't only have people from LA, it has people from 3,000 random zip codes in the US. So we are now not only looking at people from LA, so we have people from everywhere, with friends everywhere, which allows us to test for recourse, non-recourse type arguments, which I think it's crucial and it goes to the heart of your argument. Uh, what we find is uh, kind of what you expect, which is stronger, uh, stronger effects in terms of magnitude in places where a recourse is weaker. Again, LA, I mean, here, it's a non-recourse state, California, but like, we find when you do the test across both, then you get it. To kind of address your point where we look, I was just looking it up while you were talking, we look at the share, um, we look at the share of foreclosures in the zip codes of your friend, this is Zillow, this is from Zillow, and it goes positive too, but our result still goes through. So again, it, it's a way to kind of partially, partially uh, account for it. I think it's a great point, and it's pretty much the same mechanism, it's just a, you're learning about a different thing, yeah. and that's, that's, I think, the best way we have to, to address it, so it goes, it goes at that. All, everything that goes to recourse, non-recourse, also works uh, in the time series with like busts versus booms. So the asymmetry and the recourse, non-recourse, it's what strengthens and weakens the mechanism. And in the new version, we're kind of doing much more work on, on that and looking at that. Uh, you made a bunch of other points. Um, the issue about, yeah, the collateral adjustment friction. Now we are also adding the regressions uh, home ownership rate. Uh, in the zip, because now we have different zip codes with a lot of ration home, home number, so we can split by high home ownership mm -hmm. and and low, and in those uh, you have a kind of higher collection adjustment friction, and the results are also s stronger in those, which is consistent with the mimic. I think these are like all great points. So we're actually we've been thinking hard, sort of addressing, but I mean I think you gave us some suggestions that we could that we could kind of how how we do the, the specifics. Um, yeah, so the issue about the number of friends, we've tried kind of truncating, you know, removing people with few friends. The result seems to be also there, but I think that's an interesting point about whether you want to get, uh, you know, how you, where you get a more, uh, where you're overweighting people in which some friends have a lot of importance. And that's something we thought at the very beginning, but I think, I think that's an interesting thought too. And I guess the issues about, to Brian's point about income and wealth, um, we have, I think at the beginning, also instead of looking at house price, we also put controls for like income at zip code level, uh, but we, ha we haven't really explored that much. So I think, I mean, the sure answer for that is like, I think we could, we could do a bit more work looking at, uh, at other variables, especially, and, and see how correlated they are. That, uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. These are great thoughts. Thank you.